Hey folks, Joseph A. Sabora here. Well, it's been a while since I've done my last movie review, which happens to be The Expandables Free, which I definitely did not care for, since I loved the first two films very much. And I also did a new video where I created my museum project known as the Museum of Films. Yep, and I just uh, finished it last week, and I actually showed it to my sculpture class, and everything turned out okay, so... So far, so good. <laughs> well, now I'm going to do a new movie review that's going to take a trip down a memory lane in 1986, which happens to be the year my brother was born, yeah, Jason. And I was only a year old at the time. But it was the year where there were some good times and there were some bad times, but I think I'm going to mention the good mostly. <laughs> because in the summer of 1986, we had a lot of great movies such as Top Gun, Raw Deal, Cobra, My Little Pony the Movie, Legal Eagles, Running Scared, yeah. <laughs> um, Psycho Free, and of course Transformers the Movie, and Manhunter, and, and so many others that follow. Even Labyrinth, yeah, Labyrinth was a good one. Well, the list goes on and on. <laughs> But there's also a lot of films that followed in the fall of 86, even in the winter. Yeah, like Blue Velvet, yeah, Little Shop of Fours remake, yeah, many others. Anyway, I like to go to July 25th, 1986 is when this movie came out. And it happens to be the first and only movie that was written and directed by one of the famous horror novelists of all time Stephen King or Stephen King as if everybody likes to refer to you know, it doesn't matter he actually was one of the greatest novelists of all time who started coming up with stories like The Shining, Carrie, Cujo, The Stand, The Shawshank Redemption, The Body which is simply Stand By Me, The Green Mile um, the list goes on and on and on. Even Peep Show. Yes, yeah, he's been one of the kind when it comes to horror. And even ones that are not horror films. Basically just dramas. Yeah, he's the perfect guy for it. But yes, he's been doing them for years. Ever since. And he continues to do many of them. Which surprisingly enough have became all movie adaptations. And they, they all turn out to be very good. I guess, you know, Stephen King just didn't like the fact that some of his material has been cut down and everything. Well, <laughs> yeah, the fact that a lot of directors, and some good directors, by the way, thinking, oh, if, if these guys are not going to do movies that I've been doing, like, I'm going to end up doing it myself. Well, in his own words, I guess. Kind of like when he did that trailer that, that he actually came up with. Where he's only the host of, of this uh, biggest film that he ever wrote and direct. The only film. Yeah, because for those who've seen the, the trailer of this movie. Which I'm going to get to right now. Called, which is based on this short story known as Trucks. It's called Maximum Overdrive. That's right. Maximum Overdrive, Maximum Terror, Maximum Carnage, <laughs> oh, this Maximum Awesomeness, Maximum Gruesome, Maximum Gory, Maximum Exposure. <laughs> oh, this is just silly. Okay, well, let's get to the point. This was basically his first project and only project that he ever did where apparently he wanted to do a film that's based on the short story trucks it's a story about machineries mostly trucks and all the other stuff that follows are actually running by themselves without any people around so they're like it's like a ghost is actually controlling them that's right well apparently that's how it happened once we see the movie when he and his uh, producer 
Italian film producer Daniel De Laurentiis decided to release this project after Embassy Pictures was already, you know, absorbed into his production company. Well, he was really having some hard times making this movie because he didn't even know what he was doing at the time. I guess he might have been high on drugs when he was filming this. Yeah, along with all the other, you know, cinematographers, directors of photography, everybody. In fact, uh, one cinematographer actually sued him for that one accident that ha actually occurred, which happens to be the infamous uh, Steve Wilbur scene, I believe. Which, one of the wood actually went straight to his eye, and it was bleeding, too. Yeah, so he had to sue him for that because of because of that one accident. Well, he's no longer with us, but I think that might have been a big tragedy for him. Um, but um, he actually refers this movie to simply as moron movie. Yeah, because everybody in this movie is a moron. Well, some of them are smart actually, but. But you just can't help the fact that every single person in this movie is being killed. It seems like it's a bloody massacre all the way around. It sure was. Even this movie makes uh, <laughs> all the other uh, gruesome, gory films look good in general. But this also, but not only that though, this movie also had a rocking, awesome soundtrack by an Australian band named ACDC. Now, on speaking of ACDC, there was a cameo appearance that we saw right in the middle of that one scene where you actually saw an ACDC band in it. So, you're thinking to yourself, how on earth did they actually were going on tour during a bloody massacre that's happening uh, with the machinery that's running by themselves? Yeah, no kidding. But I guess they throw that as an inside joke. Not to mention the cameo appearance by Stephen King himself, where when he went to the Bank of Wilmington, the electronic marquee, as well as the ATM, was calling him an asshole. Yeah, I guess he's really a critic when it comes to this. Well, he was the asshole that made this movie, so what can you say? Okay, well, let's get back to the film, so we can save some more time because hell I like to talk more about this film because it's one of my guilty pleasures and of course it's really scary and all that. The movie stars Emilio Estevez who's always been best known for all of his work such as Young Guns, The Mighty Ducks, Stakeout, The Breakfast Club, and Repo Man and all these other films that he's been doing along with Laura Harrington, who was in the film Polly, which is from DreamWorks, you know, about the talking parrot. Pat Hingle from all the Batman movies, all four of them actually, where he plays Commissioner Gordon. Yarley Smith, who happens to be the voice of Lisa Simpson on The Simpsons. In fact, they even did a parody of that episode one time, and I believe that's on season 10. Um, yes, called Maximum Homer Drive. Yeah, so I thought that was pretty clever <laughs> that they were doing a show that's based on the movie. Also, in the movie is Ellen McElduff, Frankie Falson, Leon Ripley, Christopher Murney, John Short, J.C. Quinn, Walter Graham, Barry Bell, Patrick Milner, J. Don Ferguson and Gina Carlo Exposito, which happens to be one of his earlier films, along with a cameo appearance by simply, you guessed it, Stephen King and his wife, Tepova. And, once again, written and directed by Stephen King. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, let's get right to this movie, shall we? The movie begins set in Wilmington, North Carolina, after the Earth had passed through the tailgate of a rogue green-colored comet known as the Rhea M on June 19, 1987. 
all of a sudden every single machinery which includes big rigs trucks you know hair dryers lawnmowers steam rollers ice cream trucks um, even the electronic knife you know, the list can go on and on and on started running all by themselves as if the ghost had taken over their spirit and started controlling them you know, leading to a killing spree throughout the entire town including the tall crossing bridge that opened all the way wide causing a huge collision between cars, trucks, and motorcycles. They even throw in an ACDC band as a running joke. Well, half of the victims have been falling for their deaths, even that motorcycle guy, which I think he might have survived or he just apparently got killed because I, I had the feeling that one big truck might have fell into his entire body into the water, yeah, into the ocean. So I, I would be surprised if he didn't survive that because he would have survived for that one if he fell in. Well, anyway. Yeah, it, it was a horrible tragedy that happened to these people. But that was but that was only the beginning because after that follows the Dixie Boy truck stop was when Bill Robinson, who's played by Emil Estevez, has working on a nine hour shift with his boss, Pat Hingle, who's played by yeah, with his boss, Bubba, who's played by Pat Hingle. Um, yeah, already having some problems already going around until until the truck owner until the the, the truck stop worker by the name of of Duncan Keller who's played by J.C. Quinn who all of a sudden got blasted by a diesel gas pump that actually started shooting once it stops um, running at once he found out that it was that it actually stopped running for a while. Yeah, soon he actually had taken a rest and yeah, you know, it, it it actually shot one suddenly, you know, he got blasted and shot by a diesel gas pump that actually went into his eyes and his face and that really stunned him completely badly that he wants to have taken a rest. Meanwhile, a waitress named Wanda June, who's played by Ellen McElduff, had wound up getting um, stabbed horribly and by an electronic knife and it, and it started going out of control that it almost went straight to her you know the bottom of her shoe until Bill decided to smash it completely with the hammer and then a black customer who's played by Gina Cardo Esposito winds up in the arcade room where suddenly the whole machine was well, suddenly the entire machine was going completely out of control yeah it started running com yeah, really strange yeah he winds up taking all the cigarettes and suddenly he winds up touching the arcade the arcade game machine known as Star Castle and winds up being electrocuted and fried yeah, so that was that was really messed up. But that also leads to to the middle of the scene where where his son Dick Keller, who's played by Holter Graham, is already playing in the little leagues. Where all of a sudden his coach wants up in the soda vending machine, you know, just trying to get a cold one. Where all of a sudden the machine started to run really funny as it starts shooting tons of cans of soda right into his groin and his forehead and also shooting the entire kids in, in the playground in the entire field like it's a <laughs> like it's a tennis machine and and then and then <laughs> and little did they know a giant steamroller came to their path and suddenly winds up steamrolling one of the kids in that field and yeah and it was done in a very bloody way although they didn't show the scene though because apparently uh, Stephen Kane had to cut that scene just to avoid the X rating but if I ever get a chance to see that scene I, if I if I ever do get a chance I, I might have to be able to find a very rare VHS tape of that film 
or may or perhaps a work print if there if it's ever available online but it's really hard to find as far as I'm concerned so either way let's hope for sure but, but after that the escaping from the madness and wants up in a neighborhood filled with with so many innocent victims being already have killed in a bloody massacre yeah where the ice cream truck starts to roll by you know already filled with blood already we only run over some of the other neighbors out there lots of corpse everywhere even a dog a german shepherd that actually got killed by a toy car uh, others with electronic uh, hair dryers and even a chainsaw and all that yeah it was really messed up it also leads to other couples out there including yeah, Brett Graham, who's played by Laura Harrington, along with the businessman that she's working with. And along with uh, a marriage couple, yeah, played by Yarley Smith and John Short, yeah, named Connie and Curtis. Uh, which apparently a red truck decided to go by and started chasing them around until they finally made it into the Dixie Boys truck stop where all of a sudden their car got flipped over by them and they escaped soon they all got trapped inside the Dixie Boy trucks uh, truck stop diner and and all in the office behind in order for protection until all of a sudden a lot of secret stuff has been hidden inside which turns out to be a rocket launcher yeah yeah an M72 log rocket launcher along with lots of firearms like guns y you name it you know it's like it's obviously you know Bubba must have been working as a World War uh, possibly as a World War II veteran or so well <laughs> that pretty much explains it and since then they started shooting and and throwing all these rocket launchers everywhere on these trucks which of course was led by the Green Goblin face truck, yeah, the, known as the Happy Toys. Yeah, the Green Goblin, which of course the Green Goblin is the is the most famous villain in the Spider-Man comics. Yeah, they, they like to throw that in. Yeah. That, that was really cool that they actually added that. Anyway, they all had struggled to survive until all of a sudden half of them have gotten killed, mostly from that machine gun truck and all the other ones that followed. Yeah. And during that night, Zeke finally made it to the Dixie Boy. Well, already the businessman already just got run over earlier in the film. He had once up inside the, the pit where he was telling them to help him. Well, apparently they just left him there and he already got run over. Well, after they found out about his father's death, which apparently, yeah, he got run over too. Well, once again, they're, they're trying to struggle their ways to survive until they finally escape from the Dixie Boy truck stop. And soon, all of the trucks had started to gone completely crazy and started crashing the entire building completely. So they finally escaped in, in order to make it into the marina so they can finally get out of this location from those trucks. So they finally killed every single every single one of them one by one until everything was you know free at last yeah so that's what the movie was all about and quite frankly I really enjoyed it okay I'm not trying to be like Stephen King when he says it but I really did actually enjoy this movie I mean yes it could be stupid it could be dumb moronic at times I, I have to admit that but at the same time, it was worth it. But it, but I have to admit, though, when I was a kid seeing this movie, I was completely terrified and scared, mostly because of the, the machines that were running by themselves. I was afraid that, even as a kid, I, I was afraid that, that suddenly, like, a, like suddenly a knife was probably going to be running by themselves. Like all of a sudden, like if we try to touch the toaster or the microwave or any other electronic device, even the TV, I was afraid that I was going to get electrocuted or even worse, you know. 
winds up getting um, yeah, wound up getting killed in a very massacred way. Yeah, who who would have imagined being afraid of that if machines had run by themselves? It'd be really scary. Yeah, that's how I felt when I first saw this movie. And after seeing this movie many times, I think it really rocked. And mostly because of the soundtrack that they throw in from ACDC. To all these action scenes that they put into it. Yeah, lots of explosions with the rocket launchers and everything. Uh, I Hell, who could have forget that one scene where Bill Robinson winds up saying at the end of the film. Where he finally kills the... Uh, the Green Goblin truck where he says adios motherfucker and then it finally shoots and <laughs> yeah and then suddenly he finally explodes and after his uh, glowing red eyes starts to appear yeah. yeah that had to be one of the best scenes I've ever saw in a movie and there are a lot of great scenes in this film that, that really went into it that I thought it was really cool and there was a lot of dialogue that they went into it, especially Yarley Smith, who keeps saying, Curtis, are you dead? I know. <laughs> I mean, yes, Yarley Smith's character was really annoying. I do agree, but what do you expect from the, the voice actress that went on to do The Simpsons? Yeah, Lisa Simpson. Also forgot to mention that she also went on to do the film The Legend of Billie Jean. Winds up doing a TV appearance including an episode of Mama's Family where she played a tough girl. And of course, she winds up in, an, in the series uh, which with Hank Azaria, also from The Simpsons, called Herman's Head with William Ragsdale. Yeah, from Fright Night, which actually aired on Fox back in the early 90s. I used to watch this show, by the way. It was, it was really fun. But the movie really had everything that they were going for. I mean, I guess Stephen King really wanted to come up with a film, you know, as completely different from all the movie adaptations that he's been getting. But I guess, you know, <laughs> he was really hyped up out of his mind when he finally made this. But, Hey, I, I couldn't believe that with a 90 million budget, you can pretty much do anything <laughs> for yourself. Yeah. Well, what are the odds? <laughs> but, it, it's just, you know, I really did enjoy it somehow. I, I, it, it's already had become, you know, a cult classic. It's always fun to like listen to, you know, ACDC. I mean, I always love their songs. You know, who, who couldn't forget the song "Highway to Hell" or "Hell's Bells," and even, not to mention, "Shook Me All Night Long." You, know? you just, it just makes you want to go buy the soundtrack after seeing this movie. Yeah, because it was, it was rocking. And, yeah, it was perfect, because I started seeing this movie many times on TV. It aired on TBS, TNT, including the Monster Vision, with Joe Bob Briggs, I mean, for those who have seen that. And, I mean, that was a killer episode right there, because I used to watch uh, Monster Vision with Joe Bob Briggs. Yeah. He was awesome. And um, there's also, uh, they also started getting a lot of DVD releases at the time after being on home video for so long in Laserdisc. Yeah, Anchor Bay had released one, and then later 20th Century Fox had released a second DVD with a different cover after the other cover. And the third DVD, which is basically the same as the 20th Century Fox one, you know, the same cover art and everything. Yeah. And just recently, it just came out on Blu ray. In Italy, yeah. which sadly I, I wish we already have a Blu-ray release already in the U.S. Yeah, it's, I'm I'm still shocked to believe that that you know we still haven't gotten a Blu-ray release for this movie, um, yet alone Raw Deal or any other films that fall. I, I mean, although we did have some films that got released so far, but I just hope that this movie will get a release someday because it would be awesome, especially with the special features. 
and maybe all the other stuff that they throw in. I just hope that another company will pick it up and be able to release it so I get to own this movie like boss. <laughs> yeah. Because I really love this movie and I already own myself a DVD copy of the film that, that you know, it, it was pretty rare but I had to take it for Jan. I thought Emil Estevez did a very good job playing that role as Bill Robinson. I, I, I know a lot of people had, you know, criticized his acting in this movie. You know, given sort of a, a Carolina accent, yeah, a southern accent, sort of, but I thought he was great. And who could not forget that all the scenes that he's been doing in the movie? I mean, he played a badass in that movie. A lot of great actors kind of follow into it. I mean, well, I thought Laura Harrington was actually very good. I think she's a very underrated actress. And Pat Hingle, I mean, who could not forget in that role as Bubba? I mean, yes, he does act like a, a complete hotshot at times. But, you know, who couldn't forget the fact that this is the same actor who went on to play Commissioner Gordon in, in the Batman movies? Yeah, he, he was a great actor. I mean, no doubt about it. Yeah, but... Yes, the movie had a lot of bad acting into it. I mean, I sense that. But who cares? It may be... It may be considered as a moron movie, as he liked to refer to it, but it's an awesomely bad-ass moron movie that I've ever seen. And frankly, I never get tired of this movie. Not one bit, <laughs> that's for sure. And of course, the Ratsies have nominated Emil Estevez and S Stephen King as worst actor and worst director. Even um, King himself had admitted that it was the worst adaptation he ever worked on. Well, look at it this way. It's better than any of the other crappy movies that we've been getting for the past couple decades now. So, <laughs> which is worse, this movie or any of the other garbage that we have now? You decide. Because <laughs> I think this is one of the finest guilty pleasures I've ever seen. I mean, let's face it. It's better than any shitty movie out there. That's for sure. So anyway, I give Maximum Overdrive a solid four stars. I'm Joseph A. Sabora, and I'll see you later. Bye.